All right. Um, so my name is Brian Cook, and uh, I, with several others here, are from the Southeast Minnesota CLAC Support Group, and we have been fortunate enough for many years, uh, I think the group's been around over 20 years, to have Dr. Murray as one of our local experts uh, tap in uh, from the Mayo Clinic. And uh, so I know we have people beyond our group, which is great. Uh, that's the magic of the internet uh, from all over. And so, uh, you know, I'll turn it over to Dr. Murray and the presentation he's going to give today with the uh, uh, with our other folks here. And then we'll have, uh, after his presentation, we'll have some opportunity for question and answer. So go ahead, Dr. Murray. Thanks. Super. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and welcome to all, both uh, old friends and new. Um, and, um, you know, even though this is, as Brian has said, based from, um, based here in, in Minnesota, it is available and there are people who have signed on to this webinar from all over. So welcome to everybody. Um, so thank you for signing on to this. Uh, the talk, this talk is designed to provide some information and in-depth information on one of the many celiac disease clinical trials that are ongoing um, at the moment um, in the United States and to help, to help you determine if this is something that you might want to consider. In the first part of this talk, um, I'm going to explain the overall concept study design, why the research is needed, talk about the activities that participants will be asked to do, the time commitment needed, um, the kind of address risks and benefits and, and also how to get involved. And then after the formal part of the presentation, we'll open it up to a question and answer. And if you have any questions during the presentation, there is a question answer feature here that you can put in your questions and we'll answer them live after the presentation. There's also a chat feature where you can talk with each other on the chat or uh, with myself and my team, but please recognize that I'm not quite good at doing more than one thing at a time. Um, so there, there are some um, 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 there are some um, um, legal questions that we do have to uh, deal with because this is, like all clinical trials, are regulated. Um, now I think we'll go to Pauline. Will we go to the um, the share the? Um, yes, go ahead and start sharing your presentation, okay. and uh, I'll stop sharing mine so that you can do so. Okay. In the meantime, uh, myself, Carol, and Irina will help um, field any uh, comments and questions in the chat box in the Q&A. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. So again, this, this, this study is called Solutions for Celiac. Um, and it is sponsored by a, a clinical stage company called Immunogenics. And there are um, some disclaimers that need to be said. First of all, it is a clinical trial. Um, it's sponsored by Immunogenics with funding from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, I'm the principal investigator at the Mayo Clinic and we're one of the participating research sites for this study. This presentation I'm going to give you is going to share information about an FDA regulated clinical trial on lattaglutinase. Lattaglutinase is an investigational medication that has not yet been cleared or approved by the FDA for commercial use. Um, the, I like to talk about the, the whys, that is why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this, this type of study? And, and it's really something that it, it comes from the patients. And these are two quotes, one from Beyond Celiac Disease, the other from the Celiac Disease Foundation. And as a person affected by celiac disease, you play an important, if not critical role and critical role in advancing research by participation in clinical trials or study. There really can be no advances in um, treatments for celiac disease without the partnership of patients with the disease. 
up to 50% of patients are continuing to experience symptoms and are intestinal damage while on a gluten-free diet. Therefore, finding a better treatment than just a, a gluten-free diet is crucial. And this is a message that I've learned through my clinical practice, but it's also coming out in research such as this research done by the Celiac Disease Foundation. So uh, what about me? I know most of you who are local know me. I'm a gastroenterologist here at the Mayo Clinic. I run the Celiac Disease Program at the clinic. I've worked in celiac disease now for over 30 years. And I am the principal investigator at the Mayo Clinic for the Solutions for Celiac Disease study. Um, the study sponsor is a clinical stage company whose sole mission is to address the needs of those of, of people with celiac disease. And they've been researching and developing lattaglutinase. And this, as I said, is an investigational drug. It's a combination of two enzymes. And those enzymes have been designed to break down gluten in the stomach. Now, of course, the stomach is a hostile environment. Its job is to break down food. Um, and this, these two enzymes, this combination of enzymes is designed to actually break down gluten in the stomach. It's co-founded by Dr. Um, Jennifer Seeley Voichner, who is a PhD a biochemist who was diagnosed in celiac disease in 2002 and has since dedicated her career to trying to better the lives of those who suffer from celiac disease, basically turn her science on celiac disease. Um, so what about the study? And this is to get into the details of the study. Um, first of all, the why. That is, why develop a therapy in addition to a gluten-free diet that can help patients avoid or minimize life disruptions due to accidental gluten exposure? And we all know that this is a gluten-rich world and avoiding accidental gluten exposures is very difficult. How? This clinical trial has been conducted to validate whether the addition of this investigational medication to one's diet reduces the typical symptoms experienced due to accidental gluten exposure. So that's what it's targeting. It's targeting those typical symptoms that occur when one gets with celiac disease gets exposed to gluten. What is it? So lattaglutinase, as I said, is a mixture of those two enzymes. And they've been made to adapt it, as it were, to, to focus on gluten within the stomach and break it down before it can reach and damage the small intestine. And so that's the goal of this medication. Now, what about the, um, the study itself? Well, it consists of six visits that extend over about 26 weeks. Typically each visit lasts about one to two hours and the visits occur about every month to month and a half. And um, where does this study happen? Currently it's the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. There are three other research locations currently up and running in the US, in New York City, um, Chattanooga, Tennessee and Detroit, Michigan. And there are also, we're hoping there'd be other sites opened um, in Palo Alto, California, Boston, Massachusetts, and Chicago over the next few months that they will also get up and running in those areas. So if you know of anybody in those areas, or if you have friends or family in those areas who may be affected, please share this information um, with them. Um, I have to mention, of course, and we said it already, but this medication is a investigational medication. That means that it has not been cleared or approved by the FDA and trials are done on medications like this in order to gather the scientific information that we need to help the sponsor, that's uh, immunogenics and the FDA uh, then determine whether the medication is, is both safe and effective for use. And if they determine it to be those things, then potentially it gets approved for use. Um, now, I know that some of you have participated in clinical trials before, and I thank you for that. Um, and all these new, th as you know, for anybody who has participated, for those who haven't, without the type of support that's required for this, obviously companies, the regulatory authorities that oversee trials, as well as widespread public participation in trials, new therapies 
then can be tested, uh, authorized and approved and made available to those who need it both uh, quickly and safely. So your attendance here is important so you can learn about the study and about this process for development of a, of a clinical trial. Um, and really then be able to make an informed decision because when it comes to clinical research, there's a partnership with patients and it's critically important that participants are doing this fully informed about the study, about risks and benefits and fully have agency to make their own free decision to participate or not. And it's that partnership upon which this research is based. So when we think about lattagglutinase, it's designed, the intent is to reduce symptoms and reduce damage associated with celiac disease. It comes as a powder and it's added to water with a flavoring packet to make it more palatable. And it's drank with each major meal of the day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And the intent is, is to have that lattagglutinase in the stomach to mix with the food and to break down any gluten that may be present. Like many studies, this study is both placebo controlled and blinded. Now, what does that mean? Placebo controlled is you may get the active study medication or the placebo. And in this study, you will be getting the active study medication and placebo during different periods of the study. And blinded, what that means is neither you nor the study team will know which you are taking. That is knowing whether you're taking gluten, or sorry, whether you're taking the um, lattaglutinase or are you taking the placebo? We won't know and you won't know. Why is that? That's is so to keep us unbiased because of course we all want something to work and that can bias our symptoms or even bias our view of the study. But by having that placebo, we won't know, nor will you know, whether you're getting the active drug or the placebo. Now, the next phase that comes is what we call enrollment. So once somebody has got the sense that there is some, that they, they are interested, potentially interested in this, there is uh, some basic screening procedures. And the first is there's some basic eligibility criteria that patients need to be our potential participants between 18 and 80 years of age. So that's a very wide bar and that's uh, based on what we think is the safety of the study. The second is someone does need to have biopsy confirmed celiac disease. What does that mean? That means they have to have had a biopsy of their intestine that actually confirmed celiac disease. Um, they need to have been on a gluten-free diet for at least 12 months. That means doing their best on a gluten-free diet for at least 12 months. Um, they need to have an antibody blood test and that will need to be done in person. And then they should have recent symptoms associated with likely accidental gluten um, exposure. So these are very basic screening eligibility criteria. And many people will know this themselves. But sometimes people will have to go back to their medical records or obtain their medical records, for example, for the biopsy confirmation. And for the study, that that's an important part of screening. Now, there are some conditions, and they're called here disqualifying medical conditions. These happen in people with celiac disease, and they happen in others, of course, as well. The purpose of disqualification from the trial is we don't want to put people at an increased risk and similarly, sometimes these conditions could interfere with the safe conduct of the study for the patient or the accuracy of the study itself. So for example, if someone has type one diabetes, if they have so-called refractory celiac disease. Now, refractory celiac disease is a very rare, rare disorder. And this does not mean that the patient just doesn't heal their intestine. This is a condition of, sev well, of severe illness where the patient is quite ill, has substantial malabsorption, significant damage in their intestine, despite being on a gluten-free diet. This is a very rare, very serious condition. Active colitis, or so inflammation of the colon, active peptic ulcer disease, active esophagitis, that's severe inflammation in your esophagus. 
dermatitis herpetiformis that's active. And many of you or some of you, a small proportion of people with celiac disease get dermatitis herpetiformis, about 5%. And obviously we don't want to put somebody who's got active dermatitis herpetiformis into this study. Active irritable bowel syndrome. Now, of course, many people with celiac disease were told or maybe assumed they had irritable bowel syndrome before they were diagnosed with celiac disease. And then that, that was not a robust diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. But if somebody's been diagnosed with definite irritable bowel syndrome, then we don't want to include them. That disqualifies them from participation. Inflammatory bowel disease, of course, that's a serious combination of diseases such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, a very different disease. And if somebody's unlucky enough to have that as well as celiac disease, fortunately, they will not qualify for this study. And then a condition called functional dyspepsia, which is a disorder affecting the stomach, causing fairly severe stomach upset. That is different from celiac disease. There are other criteria that would be addressed, for example, medications, et cetera, that would be addressed in contact when the, the potential participant contacts the study team. So what are the study events and timeline? So what is it that goes on during participation in this study? And it starts with what we call a, well, first of all, is contact that you as a potential participant contacts and we'll provide that information contacts the study team, either ours or the central study team for this study. Then they're scheduled what's called a pre-screen visit. First is consent. As I've said already, agency is very important, meaning people have to be fully informed about the study and then freely provide their consent. And that's an absolutely critical first step. And then we get antibody blood testing. So we get some antibody and other blood tests that are performed at that time for at the, this pre-screen visit. Assuming that the, what we call the eligibility criteria are met, then the subject is brought back or the participant is brought back for what's called visit one. And that would often be when I would first see the patient and we would do a physical exam we would obtain some urine and blood tests and then start what's called the daily symptom diary. And that's to start to record symptoms. The next is visit two. And at visit two, the patient starts, the participant, you're now a participant, starts the study treatment periods and continues to keep this daily symptom diary done very easily, very quickly, and to record what symptoms one has had that day. And then the study is divided into these study treatment periods. There's study treatment period one. And at the end of that, there is visit three. And visit three has some questionnaires, again, urine and blood tests, and a daily symptom diary is kept. Then the participants start study treatment period two. Um, and a visit four occurs with questionnaires, daily symptom diary. And finally, then the study treatment period three. Um, and they come back then for the last visit. And it's the end of study visit with, again, more questionnaires, a physical exam at that point, urine and blood sample, and then a wrap up and exit of the study. It's important in this study, think that if there are no study related biopsies, we are not undertaking endoscopy as part of this study. It's not required in the study. Of course, as I've mentioned, to qualify the original diagnosis of celiac disease has to have been confirmed by biopsy, but we're not doing any endoscopies or biopsies. There are no injections. This is not, there's not an injectable medication that's being given or infusions. There are no surgeries. This is oral medication um, that's involved. Now, there is also, and you will see here in this uh, panel in the center, what are called the weekly snacks. Some of these are gluten-free and some are not gluten-free. And we'll talk a little bit more about what this consists of. Why include gluten in the study? And what does it mean? So most early celiac disease research 
that, that are done to try uh, identify whether a treatment is potentially effective contains or includes some exposure to gluten. This, these snacks, as I call it, they're small, relatively small quantities of gluten. And these are supposed to control the amount of gluten exposure that could occur by participants. It also ensures through this study that the investigational medication has something to act against in a control manner. So remember I said at the beginning that the point of this is to study whether this drug can help relieve or prevent the symptoms caused by accidental gluten exposure. These small level gluten exposures that are a part of this study are meant to mimic some of those exposures that occur in real life. And as many of you who live, or well, all of you who live with a gluten-free diet understand these exposures can happen almost randomly or haphazardly. You never know when you could be affected by this. So what snacks, what are these snacks? Well, these are different tasty snacks provided each week for variety. And they are derived from basically commercial food snacks. They are not a, a, a this is not gluten powder, for example. The gluten-containing snacks are eaten, less, are eaten less than twice a month. And the amount of gluten in a snack is probably about as much as a plain slice, half a slice of bread. So it's not a lot of gluten that's involved. Um, this is not what I call a standard gluten challenge. We have done a previous study where patients were given substantial amounts of gluten every day for several weeks. That's a strong gluten challenge. Um, this is more of gluten exposures, um, of low level gluten exposures that might mimic more closely what can happen accidentally. Now, what happens after a study? Well, there is a lot of data that's generated and that's data that's generated as part of the study by both you and by the study team. You're filling in questionnaires, you're entering your symptoms on a regular basis. First is your data is anonymized and kept confidential. So we have the same strict level of confidentiality as we have for all medical care. The results of clinical trials are published. Now that can be at least a year after a study ends. When you think of the complexity of study and the amount of information that's generated, it can take a full year to sometimes sift through all of the results and to get them published. But the intent, our intent is that these results will be published. This information along often with other studies are combined and then submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for consideration. And final results of this study will be put on the official government website, clinicaltrials.gov, which is a website that basically collects virtually all clinical trials in the United States and beyond. And these clinical trials, this clinicaltrials.gov, our study is contained within that. And then final results will be posted to that website for anyone to freely look at. Again, your data is anonymized and kept confidential, and the analysis is provided as grouped data. Um, you can also visit the sponsor website at immunogenics.com, and also this will be research news on Beyond Celiac Disease and Celiac Disease Foundation, both of whom have, have um, helped in the, in the uh, study uh, awareness. And both of them, you can be sure, will be um, relating any research news um, regarding the results of this study. So the intent is that once we generate the very important scientific data, come what may, this study will be um, published and disseminated because ultimately that's the point of doing this is to generate the data that can be used and trusted um, well beyond just us. That is the team of people undertaking the study and you, the participants in the study. As a clinician, as a doctor looking after people with celiac disease, but also as an investigator, safety is paramount. Your 
safety and health are paramount and they should be paramount in our minds all of our minds whenever it comes to any type of clinical trial so are clinical trials safe and how do we ensure that they're safe well they're all carried out according to these we call them good clinical practices or gcp in which all study personnel are appropriately trained and all of the trials all clinical trials follow these practices there's also a lot of overview of these we call them institutional review boards and these are people independent of the trial uh, with various expertise as well as public participants and they review the trials the how they're designed and they also are overview for how they're conducted and they are there to ensure patients rights their safety of the participants and privacy are protected um, and that of course is our primary responsibility of the investigators of the sponsors as well it should be recognized of course that all clinical trials carry some risks and benefits. And if you've got concerns, please talk to the study team, even talk to your um, primary care provider about whether something like this is right for you. And we want to provide you whatever information we can to help you make a complete and informed decision about participation. We want to see if this trial is right for you. So what about the medication? Of course, what about, this is, as I said, is an investigational medication. I can't prescribe it. It's only available as part of these clinical trials. So lataglutinase has already been evaluated for safety and effectiveness in, over nine, in nine clinical studies and has involved over 750 people. And they've been published in several places. And these are uh, what I've provided here are available public. You can look at these trial results publicly on the um, PubMed website. That's a website that publishes all clinical and, and even non-clinical science data that is in some way supported by the federal government. And um, feel free to look at any of these um, trial results that have been about lataglutinase in the past. Now, they are pretty technical, um, but they are available. And, and certainly it has been thus far very convincing that this lataglutinase seems to be safe and effective. But as I said, it's not approved, it's still investigational. So how to enroll in this study? Well, first you can talk directly to our Mayo Clinic research team, or you can go to the website to, at www.solutionsforceliac.com. Um, and that website has a screener. You can put in information um, about it. Um, there's a pre-screener online um, that you can fill out that asks for basic information. And if you're pre-qualified, then a, a study team member will contact you to talk to you or tell you more about the study and ask any additional qualification questions and answer them. And then if you continue to qualify, You'll then study your first in-person visit at the Mayo Clinic with our team, or if it's one of the other centers, of course, with one of those other centers. The lead study coordinator here at Mayo is um, Carol Van Dyke, who has been with our celiac team now for some time. And this is her email. And of course, there's also the general study contact for somebody who is from further away than um, our region. And that is at info at solutions for celiac. Dot com. I thank you for your attention and for listening to me. And um, I do hope that you'll consider what we've talked about and feel free to share this information and um, with others who might be interested. At this time, we're going to move to our question and answer um, and period. I'm going to stop sharing. Hey. Thank you so much for that great presentation walking through the study, Dr. Murray. Uh, we have one question um, come in uh, that Irina answered, but I'd like to allow you the opportunity to answer it online for the rest of um, our listeners here, our attendees, in case they don't see the question and answer uh, box. Uh, so someone asked here uh, whether um, you have to be strictly following a, if you have been strictly following a gluten-free diet, 
wouldn't your antibody blood test not reflect that you have the disease? Could you address that question? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. So if somebody um, has completely healed celiac disease and they're, um, or if they're, and they're being very strictly, often their, their blood test will become completely negative. Um, and so is that, but it's not a, an absolute guarantee. Sometimes people will still have activity of the disease, even if their antibody blood test is negative. So it's not a hundred percent accurate. Um, for this study, we do want to have at least a hint that there has been some level of exposure by the antibody test status. And that's where that qualification comes in. And that, and that blood test is taken at that first, we call it that first visit, that pre-screening visit, is that's where that, that blood test occurs. Uh, another question came in. Um, someone had a piece of bread on accident about three years ago and was sick uh, for a, quite a, uh, for a whole week. Um, uh, is the hope, so the hope is that limit the amount of time or eliminate, sorry, let me um, try and rephrase the question here. Um, is the hope that this study medication would eventually limit the amount of time one was sick or el eliminate the, the, the feeling of uh, symptoms of sickness after accidental gluten so, exposure? Um, so the, the goal of the latter glutenase as it, the way it's designed is to break down gluten very quickly and to break down the immune stimulating parts of gluten. And if you can break those down, you can basically stop the and prevent the immune response to gluten. And if you prevent the immune response to gluten, the intent is that the person doesn't get sick, or if they do get symptoms, they're much milder and don't last as long. Now, that is the intent of it. And as the, as the questioner experiences, unfortunately, this is such a common problem. People accidentally get exposed to gluten and then they get sick. And sometimes that can be a day or two, sometimes a few hours, but sometimes it can be even longer. And if latagglutinase would work, if it's safe and effective, the goal is that it would prevent that type of symptom from occurring with those accidental gluten exposures. Thank you, Dr. Murray. All right, so we have uh, two other questions here. Uh, should the participant try to change their diet during the study, become more strict, or take more risk? Okay, so that's an excellent question. So we are studying real life. We are trying to study what happens to people who are living with celiac disease in a real life. We don't, you know, they, they shouldn't be people who are eating gluten every day. Like if they're going out to eat cookies and bread and pizza on a daily basis, um, you know, they're not really on a gluten-free. We want people who are doing their best in real life on a gluten-free diet. We don't want them to change their diet otherwise. We don't want them suddenly becoming living in a bubble and because that's not real life. So we want people to live real life. That means don't get rid, take more risks, don't go out eating more gluten. At the same time, don't live in a bubble. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And then we have another question here. Does the participant take the drug slash placebo daily? Okay, that's an excellent question. And this is meant because it works, the latagglutinase works by mixing with the food when it's in your stomach. You take it with each meal. So it's very simple. You take that powder preparation, mix it up, and then take it with your meal. And what it does is then it's there to break down the gluten when it's in the stomach. So it does need to be taken with each meal. And uh, just to further expand upon that, there is, um... I think there's a, a, a couple of weeks at the beginning that the drug and placebo may not be taken, um, but it, it, it is pretty much taken day, daily. And there's a period where you take this, uh, the treatment medication and a period where you take the placebo and you switch mm -hmm. out. So yes. every participant gets both in the study. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an excellent point, Pauline, is that there are... Um, there are um, days when you will receive the drug and it'll be with each meal. And then time periods are days when you receive the placebo with each meal. But there are also time periods in the study like screening where you will not be receiving either one. 
Um, I see a question, is there a meal schedule? Well, we want people to take their meals uh, you know, reasonably collected together. I mean, uh, there are some uh, people who, who graze, basically who will eat small amounts multiple times during the day. And this study is not really designed for that. It's designed to capture the gluten in the stomach at the time of a meal. So broadly speaking, we want people to take the th you know, up to three meals. We want them to take their meals in a, you know, a time period, not just spread over eight hours or 10 hours of the day. Uh, but they're not forced into timing those at any particular schedule. Um, and another question is about, do we get the medication at the meetings or is it shipped to us? And are there any costs involved? Both excellent questions. So first, the medications are provided to the individuals at the visits. And Carol Van Dyke is on, Carol's our lead study board. Do you want to talk about the process about how you sh share the medications, for example? And also there are questions about costs. Do, Carol, do you want to address those? Yeah, when you come in for your visit, um, you meet with the study coordinator, coordinator or what, a member of the team and we, we swap out the drugs. You bring the old drug back and we give you a new, a new supply. And we explain things um, multiple times to you at each visit to make sure you understand and, and we try to make it as simple as we can. So, yeah. Um, another um, question is about costs. So there are, there are oh. no charges for any of these procedures done as part of this study. No, you know, there the is study no visits, cost. Yeah, no cost to you. Um, also, um, Another attendee is asked, what if they travel for work? Can they still participate in the study? Yes, that we can make that work. Um, obviously, we do have to keep to the schedule uh, in terms of visits. Um, but we have had study participants who travel a lot for work. Um, and we are trying to capture what is real life for people with celiac disease. Um, it looks like, uh, uh, did you already answer the question if the medication uh, is shipped to them or provided at the um, consultation? I think um, Carol mentioned that it's, it's yeah. provided to you. You basically bring back what's left from the previous period and then Carol gives you the, the new or the study coordinator gives you the, the new um, medication for the next treatment period. Mm. We can't, we can't ship it. Mm. Okay, um, all right, this as answer that. And then we have a question in the chat here. Uh, if someone is currently healing from celiac related issues, SIBO, would a person still be able to participate? S-I-B-O, SIBO. Okay. Um, so when we do our, um, our pre-screen visit, we do have to identify if there are other conditions that are ongoing that could interfere with the study. Because of course, we want to address whether this experimental drug works for glut for helping the symptoms that occur with accidental gluten exposure. If people are unfortunate enough to have other conditions, that muddies the water. And we often have to, unfortunately, sometimes have to exclude people. But if people have questions, feel free to contact us. Go through the pre, go on the uh, website, go on, do the pre-screener. We can always determine there's no nothing lost um, if it turns out that you don't, at, at, at least um, check it out. We can check it out to see if it's an issue or not. Also, part of what, of course, what I do as, a, as an investigator is to assess if those um, other issues are present, or is it really that the patient just has symptoms of celiac disease, which is, of course, what we're trying to capture. And many of you who've lived with celiac disease or even lived through the period before you were diagnosed with celiac disease, know that often there are many diagnoses that are searched for, are considered before the celiac disease is discovered. Thank you. I see someone has raised their hand for uh, quite a while now. Um, as Chris, I'll let, allow you to talk. Would you like to present your question? Hello, as Chris, did you have a question that you wanted to ask aloud? Maybe not, maybe it's an accidental hand raise. So I will um, lower hand and 
So there's a question about the daily diary. So Carol, do you want to address the daily diary, how it's administered? Yeah, the daily diary comes to you each day by an email and you answer it through the email. It, it will probably take you three minutes to answer all the questions. It's basically just hitting on what symptoms you've had in the last um, 24 hours. So it's collected every day and it's done in the evening. So we're collecting all the symptoms through the day. And, and the reason that we want to do this every day, it might seem, oh, that's a bother to fill out questions is uh, human nature is our memory of what has happened to us is colored by what happened recently. So uh, we used to do studies, this is quite a few years ago, where we would ask people, how was your last week? Of course, my last week is what was yesterday. Um, and so by collecting it daily, we really collect in real time what people's symptom experience is. And that is a requirement now of the FDA that we accurately record what people's symptoms are. When I meet with subjects, par sorry, pardon me, participants, when I meet with people who are considering participating, I talk about three priorities. The first priority is your health and welfare. That is my top priority for you as well as yours. The second is we do good work. That means we follow the protocol. We follow the design so that we respect everybody who is participating in the study. And the third priority is what I call the documentation or trust priority. We write it down. We record what happens in the study and the participants are also recording on a daily basis what they are experiencing. And by doing that, by documenting that, then all of these regulatory authorities, they know what we've done. And by doing so, by documenting that, we provide enough information so that the greater community, that is the people with celiac disease, public health, the, the regulators, all can trust what we've done. And that's a critical part of what we do in clinical research in this partnership with patients who become participants in clinical research. And so, yes, there's the daily diary, which, as Carol said, comes by email and takes literally three minutes to click on, fill out the questions, and those results are tracked. And then the symptoms are, are largely the gastrointestinal symptoms. Those are the main symptoms that seem to be an issue on a daily basis. Of course, people with celiac disease experience other things in their symptom life, as it were. But the ones that are being focused on are largely gastrointestinal symptoms. And I think of things that patients complain of bloating, abdominal pain, abdominal distress that occurs when someone gets exposed to gluten. I would, uh, I would like to also add, um, hi, this is Irina. Um, I'm the other coordinator. Um, this could also include um, bloating, um, uh, constipation. Also, um, some uh, participants do tend to have a... Um, uh, uh, brain fog as well, even though, um, so all these symptoms um, are captured in our daily diaries. Thank you, Irina. It looks like we don't have any more questions in the Q&A or the chat box here. I'll leave it open still in case any anyone has any questions that come in as we wrap up here. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Murray, for presenting and Carol and Irina uh, for also being here to help uh, support uh, any answering any of the questions that the attendees have. Uh, I would like to uh, maybe now allow uh, Brian and Kathy to perhaps talk a bit more about their organization. Uh, sure, this is Brian and uh, I, uh... First of all, I wanna thank Dr. Murray and, and others for presenting today. Um, yeah, uh, I guess just our group, Southeast Minnesota CELAC group, one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is uh, kind of shaking everything up like it has every place else in society. And um, we've been doing a lot of our meetings online. So we're actually open to anybody joining. You don't have to be in Southeast Minnesota. So if anybody's interested in joining, uh, I'll just post the URL here, uh, but we typically have uh, four to six meetings a year, and some of the presentations uh, were graced with Dr. Murray, usually giving a yearly presentation on where we are with research. Uh, we've had dietitians talk, and then sometimes we just have meetings 
where we just uh, share, you know, what have people learned lately? What have people, uh, sometimes it's restaurants, things to order online, you know, the gluten-free diet, we have a daughter who has celiac is a ongoing journey and luckily things have gotten a lot better over time. But, uh, but yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just post a quick message here if, if you're interested. It'll be both the, uh, just our website, uh, and I just posted that to everyone. And if you want to contact us at all, um, I'll post an a email if you have any questions. Um, so anyway, we just open it. It's all about just exchanging information. And uh, one of the things, uh, our group has been around over 20 years. And uh, it's been interesting because one of the biggest things we do is we share. We have a lot of veterans <laughs> that have had celiac for a long time and have a lot of good information. But it's also amazing how often somebody gets a diagnosis. And because we partner with Mayo Clinic, they sometimes we get brand new people. And it's amazing how often being there for somebody who's just started this journey can be reassuring to them with all the resources that are out there uh, and the research going on and, and obviously the new food products that are available and, and the labeling and everything. So, so anyway, that's, I guess, uh, just wanted to put that out there and we're open to all. So feel free and... Uh, Thanks again. Thank you for those comments about um, sharing information about your organization. We'll make sure to include those links and your email in the uh, email that goes out to all of the attendees and even to those that weren't able to attend today. They'll get information about your organization. All right. So I don't think uh, no additional questions or other comments from attendees has come in today. So I guess we'll just Go ahead and uh, wrap things up and thank everyone for their time again this morning. Uh, again, to the panelists as well, Dr. Murray, Carol, Irina, uh, for your time today to share this information with all of these interested um, uh, people in the community. Um, would you like to, uh, to add any parting words, Dr. Murray, Carol? Well, again, this is a partnership. It's a partnership in care. It's also a partnership in advancing science. And um, Brian and Kathy, thank you for your continued support. I think um, I joined the Southeast Minnesota support group before I joined the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> I attended the first meeting before my first day at the Mayo Clinic 23 years ago. Um, so it is a partnership that is, for me at least, gives me support, inspiration, uh, for what I do and for what we all do at the at the Mayo Clinic. I mean, it, it is uh, those of you who live here and some of you who work here recognize that the Mayo Clinic is based in its community. And uh, I think no better example than how we do this in celiac disease. So um, keep up the great work. Keep up that fellowship, that support for um, especially for those newbies who arrive sometimes with that shell shock look. Um, you know, with a new diagnosis, it, it makes it does make that journey a little easier to have people who have been down that road walk with you. Um, and I think that one of the, the really difficult things about the pandemic is a lot of that personal contact, personal is communication is is not available. But at the same time, it's opened up a whole new era of more virtual contacts. Mm -hmm. um, so I thank you for what you do and also for making this forum available today to share this important clinical research. Thank you and everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Great weekend, everyone, and uh, enjoy your rest of your Saturday and your Halloween. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.